service games more commonly known around the world as Sega, is a video game production studio known for creating the likes of Sonic the Hedgehog, the Yakuza series, and... well, nothing else going by the last 10 years. But Sega used to be a console manufacturer as well. I know it might seem trivial for me to mention this, but it's been so long since the release of Sega's last console that it's possible someone as old as 20 could have never seen any of Sega's home console offerings. Yeah, it's been that long. That last console? The Sega Dreamcast. Released November 27th, 1998, and officially discontinued in 2001? That's it? Following the constantly memed-on release of the expensive-to-produce memory hole that was the Sega Saturn, Sega needed to cut back on the cost of components and make a more subdued console with more readily available parts to recoup their losses. This resulted in the creation of the Dreamcast, which launched prior to all of the other 6th generation gaming consoles, but was also not insignificantly less powerful than the PS2, Xbox, or GameCube. Despite having a variety of all-time first-party classics like the Sonic Adventure Duology, Jet Set Radio, and Shenmue, alongside shockingly revolutionary internet integration like online play, DLC, and free updates, the Dreamcast's confusing better-than-5th-gen, worse-than-6th-gen graphics, lacking third-party support outside of sports games, and the approaching release of the most successful video game console in history, all meant this beautiful little white box wasn't long for this world. As a result of its minuscule three years of relevance, the Dreamcast library is a mystery to most in the modern age. Outside of first-party stuff like, again, Sonic or Space Channel 5, Dreamcast games don't tend to get any forms of re-release. This means there's three years worth of games made for one of the largest names in gaming that barely exist outside of one-paragraph Wikipedia articles and the occasional mention on an enthusiast forum, and I think that's tragic. So, with no specific criteria, I randomly picked a handful of the obscure Dreamcast games I thought would be fun for me to look back on, sharing these oddities with the world to give them a little taste of Sega's youngest abandoned child. Heads up, there might be a reason nobody talks about these anymore. Let's start off with this one, Super Magnetic Neo, the only game in today's video that a few people I asked could actually identify. I'd tell you the premise as set up by the opening cutscene, but the game is quite... chaotic and shouty. It would seem that these guys, the Pinky Gang, have taken control of the Pow Pow Amusement Park, the favorite vacation spot of this no-name professor. To keep the park safe, the professor deploys a robotic AI clone of himself with magnetism powers to stop said Pinky Gang. That's it, that's the whole story. But it's a late 90s platformer, I'm not really concerned with the narrative. Our cheerful protagonist is Neo, known as Niu Niu in the Japanese release. He's a robot with a retractable contraption on the top of his head, capable of sending out intense magnetic waves of either polarity. By changing the type of force you surround yourself with, you can either magnet over to a polarized spot, or eject yourself away from it. This also applies to magnetically charged enemies that can be knocked away or pulled towards you, where you can turn them into a tidy little throwable box. Learning to swap between north and south on the fly, and even in midair, will prove to be an invaluable and required skill later in the game. Doubly so thanks to this game's bafflingly awkward momentum physics that will either send you nowhere, or send you rocketing off into no man's land. This absolutely takes some time to get a hang of. It's like teaching your brain to play Guitar Hero, but the track keeps mirroring back and forth. So wait, I press B here to zoom in, and then an A to grab this, and then B again to bounce off this, and it's, it's a lot. But it is unique and engaging. On the basic side, Neo can dash by holding the right trigger, which consumes this meter, and has your requisite single jump. Nothing more and nothing less. It can't even damage enemies. Let's cut to the chase. Somehow, someway, the jump is bad. I can't tell if it's the height, the weight, 
As one of the 10 people on Earth who still plays 3D platformers on a regular basis, I like to think I know what's up when it comes to these sorts of things. But despite the few hours I spent on this game, I never, at any point, felt confident in any jump that I made. And forget about dashing jumps for extra range. Those things were a frustrating heart attack every time, and I avoided using them whenever possible. I'd usually end up barreling off into nowhere. There is a possibility that my method of recording is introducing some amount of input lag. That's what I thought at first. But doing some research into reviews from both recent times and way back when, when Neo released, I found multiple mentions of slippery controls and the jump being unresponsive. I swear to God he doesn't jump sometimes. There's a little bit of a delay on it. It's not worth worrying about yet. The first world, the jungle world, goes smooth. Controls aside, I was having a good time. The Crash Bandicoot titles are some of my favorite games, period. And Neo has a very similar 3D corridor setup. There's a gold ID card in each level that unlocks a bonus challenge room, where you can pick up a bunch of extra Z coins for more lives. Said challenge rooms are timed and ask a lot more from you in terms of chaining magnet gimmicks together. There's even an entire section on the main menu dedicated to this type of challenge room where you can practice your skills. Super Magnetic Neo's layout is standard platformer fare. Four levels, then a boss in each world. Said bosses are certainly bosses. All four world bosses and even the final boss function the same. You avoid their attacks for a bit, they send out some goons, you box them up real nice and ship them out straight to the bad guy's squishy vulnerable bits. It's all simple as can be for the moment. The second world starts off with a completely 100% original riding sequence that is in no way inspired by any marsupial you might have heard of, before switching gears over to the heavy use of timed switches. These bits have very surprisingly strict time limits. I'm talking nearly flawless execution required in precarious areas. But despite all that, I was still thinking of recommending this game to you guys at the time. Then I got to the third world, 3-2 specifically, where I almost gave up. Yeah, a children's cutesy platformer was so hard I almost quit. Me, the guy who played Battle Network 4 twice for a joke. This level is an excellent case study of Super Magnetic Neo's flaws. The jumping is strangely heavy and short, I've mentioned that, but the other huge misstep in this game's design is its camera. The most important aspect of platforming in a platformer is the ability to correctly judge your jumps and movements. Now, look at some of these shots. The depth perception on these ranges from kind of sketchy to are you serious? Oh, what do you got there? Is that a... Neo? Neo, Neo, don't you fucking dare get in that minecart. Hey, remember those Donkey Kong Country levels that are infamous for being more about memorization than any kind of skill? What if you had to play one of those, but judging every jump is literally impossible? Look, if you're shocked and mad at me right now, so am I. How the hell did this fun, obscure game review turn into a frustrated rant? There is no part of me that thought I was going to be angry at this wacky kids game from dying over and over. I know it doesn't look bad, the footage is not doing justice to what it's like to play this for yourself. Even I think it looks way easier as I edit this. The fourth and final world, Future, is an amazing looking world, being a neon cityscape. But the pain only increases. See, prior to now, the more complex magnet acrobatic chains had been short and mostly limited to optional paths or collectibles. Now they're mandatory, and you have to do them quickly and flawlessly, and there's a lot of them. So many of them require perfectly understanding the bunk-ass momentum as you fling yourself from point to point. It's a non-stop hair-pulling mess. Hell, the developers knew this, so there's a 1-up very close to most every checkpoint that you can recollect every time you die. The game does this a lot, come to think of it, and it feels like more of an insult rather than a peace offering. Why even have a live system if you clearly intended for the players to die repeatedly? And back then, this might have been a novel thing, but for me, living here in the present day, I'm... I, I'm so sick of, of games being purposefully, annoyingly difficult and full of trial and error. I know I'm repeating myself, but it really is the control that's holding this game back so hard. The level design is interesting, the world and graphics are bright and colorful, and it has a really interesting gimmick with the magnet powers. But none of that matters when I can't move about the world properly. We get to the final boss, uh, 
No, no, not the not the robot. The true final boss is this nefarious lip right here. Because of the way the boxes bounce when they're thrown, there's a 50-50 shot the box will smack into this edge and miss entirely. After being blessed by the luck gods for a few hits, the boss will enter its second phase, where it throws its detachable magnetic titties at you, and yeah, no, I'm, I'm out, that's enough. Next game. If I had a nickel for every time I reviewed a mediocre 90s reboot of a classic arcade game, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Centipede was an arcade game in the early 80s by Atari that could best be described as uncomfortably aggressive space invaders. One of the first games to use a trackball for its more precise movements, Centipede is regarded as an all-time arcade hit, right up there with Namco's many video game staples. A giant centipede works its way down a board filled with mushrooms while the player fires at it from their blaster ship. Each segment of the centipede can move independently when shot off, and every segment has to be destroyed to advance. A billion ports and pseudo-sequels would follow in the coming years, as is tradition. Fast forward to the late 90s, and Atari, alongside other owners of old arcade properties, began to try and reboot their IPs for a more modern audience, giving birth to Centipede. That's it. That's, that's what they called it. The game opens with a surprisingly foreboding and moody cutscene, explaining that hot centipede lore. Every hundred years, a swarm of demonic insects led by the Queen Centipede resurrect and claw their way up to destroy the surface world. And every time, the humans have to find a hero to fight back against the bug army, piloting their specially crafted combat hovercraft, the shooter. This go around, the hero finder dousing stick points to a random bean counter in the middle of nowhere named Wally Gudmanson, who's violently yanked from his slumber and slapped into the shooter with no preparation. And hey, points to the developers, that right there? That's an accurate reflection. That's you playing this game. In spite of a dozen graphical and aesthetic changes, Centipede is almost disappointingly adherent to its arcade roots. You get locked into small arenas and fight off waves and waves of killer centipedes and other creepy crawlers that will be happily blindsiding you your entire playthrough. There's a handful of camera options to pick from, but you're gonna want this one. As cool and immersive as the other cameras might be, they're entirely worthless. You also have a small jump and I'll be honest, I never got to a point where it saw any serious use. Outside of your basic shooting and jumping, there are power-ups that can drop from mushrooms, expected buffs like spread shot or a shield, the latter of which is especially useful since the lightest tap reduces you to ashes. The game isn't exactly complicated, but you're gonna need a lot of lives for this one, which means a lot of points, which means protecting the wee people dotted around the world. In addition to preventing their buildings from being smashed, you can save stranded wee people by slamming into them at top speed, which will prompt an adorable... This is unironically the part of the game that's had the most staying power in my head all these years. I wondered why something so innocuous could possibly be all I remembered about this game. But playing it again jogged my memory. There's no way my younger self ever got anywhere in this game, so there wouldn't have been anything to remember. This game is tough. Centipede is a fine time in co-op, you can play the entire game in two-player split-screen. And if you're super into simple arcade-style games, I think you'll enjoy this one. I can appreciate the attempt to be unique, stylistically, at the very least. Hell, if this was released nowadays, it'd just be the arcade version with an obnoxious neon filter over it and exploding lens flares all over the place, so I think we should be glad we got what we did. Oh, okay, so uh, this was meant to be the big finish, you know, the weirdest Dreamcast I ever played. Let's laugh at it, <laughs> but I finished the entire game in 20 minutes. Let me explain. Tina! Cute! Mr. Ball! Black! Sneak! What a clown! Jaw! Always bursting with energy. Hollow music. They're gonna be burning up the ice today. The Pan Pan Triathlon is about to begin. Hmm. What? What, are you expecting a funny observation or like a pun or something? Buddy, look at this shit. It writes itself.
Even the loading screens in this game are fucking bonkers. Have you ever seen a pink hippo penguin staring longingly at Swedish butter or whatever language that's supposed to be? No, no, I don't think you have. Pen Pen Tri Isolon, that's a stretch even by my standards, is a platforming racing game released by forgotten failed studio Land Ho as a launch title for the Dreamcast. It takes place on an iced over planet called Iced Planet. Batting a hundred so far. A planet which is populated primarily by sleep paralysis demons called pen pens. Colorful penguin-like creatures that love racing each other across the frozen landscape. That's it, that's the lore, enjoy. You choose to play with up to four players, which I'm convinced has literally never happened. I'm 100% positive that if you gather four people around your Dreamcast and this option is selected, a hit squad sent directly from Sega will splatter your brains all over the wall and erase any trace of you having ever existed so as to never allow any of your spawn to enter the gene pool. So then you select your favorite pen pen and have deeply unsettling races against each other. Gameplay takes the form of triathlon-style sort of mini-game races in one of four areas. I'll talk about this in a second. And has your chosen nightmare rotating between sliding, running, or swimming depending on the terrain. Sliding requires rhythmic A presses, running is your standard walking and jumping stuff, and swimming requires rhythmic A presses. They, they couldn't even think of a third distinct minigame, which is to be expected when you see the track variety, or rather lack thereof. There are only four courses in Pen Pen Racing, each one divided into separate legs, and each one taking about three or four minutes to clear. Sweet, toy, horror, and junk. It was a different time, I guess. The actual game itself really isn't that bad. I'm a sucker for these sort of platformer racing games, and there's so few of them out there. It's just that there's no time or place for extended thoughts or strategies or observations or anything, because the game is just so short. That's it. My entire playthrough, not counting the time I spent laughing at the character designs, was literally 20 minutes. It took me longer to write and edit this section than it did for me to play the goddamn game. I'm severely let down by this. There are no unlockable courses. Uh, there's one unlockable character, but I cannot muster the strength to give a shit. And some skins and hats. But as anybody who's played a shooter in the last five years can tell you, grinding cosmetics is not an adequate replacement for real content. <sighs> Fuck. I, I can't just leave the video like this. This two minute blurb about some penguin fever dream isn't a proper conclusion. Let me let me head back to the Dreamcast release list and see what else I can dredge up. I, I gotta reach down, deep down to my origins. What would 2018 John do? Oh my, oh my god, god, this channel sucks. sucks. I'm, I'm wasting my life. I'm a failure. Yeah, of course. He'd cover an obscure horror game. Hey there guys, I'm recording this on Mother's Day, so let's make this quick. Thank you very much for watching and supporting the channel as always, and a super duper ultra special awesome mega fucking radical dope gnarly thank you to all of the sick members of the KNI John Patreon. You can see their lovely names scrolling across the screen right now. Doubly so this time, because as you can see, I have swapped over to a much superior editing software compared to the one I was using before. And while I love this new software and the things it gives me the capability to do, my computer cannot handle it. <laughs> So this video took forever to make despite being so short, simply due to the fact it kept constantly freezing. But thanks to the members of Team Kernel, I've already put it in order for some upgraded parts that should help editing go much more smoothly in the future. So thank you again. Don't worry, you won't have to wait another month for the next part of this video. I've already recorded and scripted the entire thing. It's just a matter of waiting for those parts to show up in a couple days so I can edit at a reasonable speed. That's all for today though, guys. Thank you again, as always. And I will see you again sometime in the near future. Bye bye.